So thanks for checking out this video. I hope that through what you hear, you really grow to understand how much God has shown his love for us in Jesus. At Brainerd, we want to help people who are far from God to become committed followers of Jesus. But still, you know, nothing replaces what God does when followers of Jesus actually gather together in community as a church. So this video could never be a substitute for that. And our prayer is if you haven't found a church home, you would find that soon. And with that, let me tell you, we'd love to meet you sometime soon at Brainerd. So I pray that God speaks to you, and please reach out if we can answer any questions or serve you in any way. If you have a copy of God's Word, can we take it and turn to Ephesians 2? Ephesians 2 is where it will be today. Um, Some of you know what it's like. Some of you have felt some of the pain, some of the challenge of not fitting in to a certain group. Some of you know exactly what it means to feel like you're kind of for a variety of reasons on the outside looking in. And again, it could be a lot of different reasons, a lot of different factors that put you in a certain maybe stage of life. So maybe it is um, age or maybe it's an economic status that makes you feel like everybody else is in this group, but you're not in the in group. Or it may be you've made a move, had a change in geography. It could be education status that you always feel like is somewhat limiting. It, it, it means you're not a part of whatever circle. Maybe it's genetics or personality. Maybe it's ethnicity or that, that makes you feel a little bit like an outsider it's tough to feel alienated, and listen, even at church, we're sometimes not immune from feeling like somehow we are on the outside. So I remember talking with a lady who'd probably been a believer. I think her testimony would have been she's been a, had been a believer for decades, I think longer than I had been alive, and talking with her one Sunday, much like this Sunday, before church, and her expressing just how hard it was to feel like everybody had this certain relationship with Jesus and she felt a little bit like she was on the outside looking in, like she didn't really have that close walk with Jesus despite the fact that she knew she was a Christian. I think even of my own church experience where uh, many of you know I have a mentally handicapped sister that's six or seven years older than I am and she's never spoken. And certainly when you come in the room with uh, someone who has some mental disabilities and it's uh, very visible that she has that, you get stares and you kind of wonder, am I on in a, in a group that's going to fit here, even at church? Ephesians 2 has brought good news. Last week, we looked at such good news that not just that Jesus is alive, but because he's alive, if you're trusting in him, you're alive. And not just that Jesus is risen from the dead, but if you're trusting in him, you're risen never to die again. And, and if you're trusting in Jesus, not just as he's seated above all authorities and powers, but you're co-seated with him. And we looked at all this good news, but there's more good news today, and that is you're no longer on the outside looking in. You're no longer alienated. Whatever the status, whatever makes you think you're on the outside looking in, Jesus has brought you in. And that's really what I want to look at today. I, I want you to know we're going to plow through some territory here that means you know some background about the Old Testament. And sometimes it's a little bit tricky in the New Testament because some of the presenting issues that we find in the New Testament aren't necessarily the ones that we have. So the things that they struggle with maybe in first century Ephesus, like that Jew-Gentile divide, like a church that was made up of majority Gentiles, but, but was started with the Jews. I mean, there's some of those things that we don't face, we don't deal with necessarily week in, week out. So there's a tendency to feel a little bit of distance from that. But I actually want to ask you, I really want to encourage you to lean in as we read some of this stuff from the Old Testament and lean in because actually through the work of Jesus, God is still bringing outsiders in, whether it's the exact same thing that was going on in Ephesus, God is still bringing those that were alienated from him, bringing them in I think you'll find a lot of relevance today. So actually, I want to read Ephesians 2, verse 11. I'm going to read all the way to the end of the chapter. Ephesians 2, I'm going to begin in verse 11. It should be on the screens if you don't have uh, a copy of God's word. Paul says this, So then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. 
At that time, you were without Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship of Israel. Foreigners to the covenants of promise, you were without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who made both groups one, tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. He made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both the God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. And he came And he came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer foreigners, no longer strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. This is God's word. And when we talk about what it means to come from an outsider, to be an outsider and to become an insider, I want us to ask just a couple questions of these verses. So kind of just mental, mentally for us to walk through them. The first question that I think is helpful in asking is what exactly has happened? What has happened to move us from being outsiders alienated, pulling us in as insiders now? And we encounter pretty quickly, as you look at verses 11 to 13, you encounter pretty quickly uh, a problem that arose in many of the first churches of Jesus in the Mediterranean in that first century. Notice verse 11 puts it this way. There, were, there was a group who were Gentiles, and yet there were Jews. So they are those who are circumcised, looking at the Gentiles, and they got this label. Humans are good at labeling, and they labeled, you are the uncircumcised, implying there's some sort of division. So circumcision was this physical sign that really marked off the people of God. But it was more than just a physical sign. It was always meant, you can read Deuteronomy on this, it was always meant to show something of the heart, not just a physical act. The physical act, much like baptism and Lord's Supper, the physical acts are saying something's gone on with my heart. And so that was the sign of circumcision. It went all the way back to Genesis 17. But something's gone wrong in exactly how it's being understood at that church in Ephesus, maybe all around. And we know that because like a check engine light comes on in verse 11 because this circumcision, Paul, Paul highlights it's made with hands. And anytime you read that, especially in the Old Testament, that idea of something made with hands, it's talking about statues and idols and false gods, things that humans put together. So somehow this thing that the Lord had given, this rite, this ritual, had become something that was just we as humans moved it into something it wasn't meant to be. And so there's, there's something going on here. As a matter of fact, if you compare like the not made with hands with all the, th- or the things made with hands with the things not made with hands, you have things like the temple and our heaven, heaven, uh, the new temple that Jesus is creating and a, a temple not made with hands or our heavenly dwelling place not made with hands. And so you see even a difference. There's some I don't know, you kind of pick up on at least a whiff of derogatory, kind of dismissive. Oh, you're that group. You're not part of this group. But one thing that's made clear in verse 12, so I I hope you have God's word in front of you. In verse 12, it's, it's, yeah, actually the distinction wasn't wrong though. There really was a difference between Jew and Gentile. And it digs hard into that point in verse 12. So at that time, Speaking to a predominantly Gentile church, which here we are today, at that time, before Christ had come, you you were without Christ. I mean, it actually says five different things here. You were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope, and without God in the world. You were alienated. You were without Christ. What does that mean? Well, the Jews had a Messiah, 
The Messiah was the king who would bring salvation. They had that. They were counting on that Messiah to come. And Gentiles didn't have that Messiah. You were alienated from the citizenship of Israel, so there were political and national implications of that, and you were outside looking in as a Gentile. He says you also were alienated, you were strangers from the covenants of promise, so God made covenants, these binding agreements. And he made those with the people of Israel. We kind of start with the covenant made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, where I will bless you, you will be a blessing. But he's making it to that family, and he makes it to the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai. And he makes it to King David, and like one of your descendants, King David, will be king forever, an eternal king. And what Paul's saying is you were actually alienated from that. You were without hope. So some of you will remember when you read the stories of Jesus' birth in Luke 1 and 2, Matthew 1 and 2, you have all these people that were, had a lot of hope. So Simeon and Anna and Mary and Zechariah are just like, we have hope that one day Messiah is going to come. And you even have, you have a John the Baptist. Are you the one we should be looking for? Do we wait for another? I mean, there was all this hope. And he says, Gentiles, you didn't have that hope. And you didn't have, you were without God. So they certainly weren't without little G-O-D-S, little gods. I mean, they had plenty of those. But all the spiritual beings that we can muster up in our imagination, all the higher powers and the energy, so however we want to frame it, like that also, that just rings pretty hollow and compared with someone who's like, they know God and God knows them and they are his people and he is their God. So outside looking in, outside looking in, but verse 13, there's like this hard break with that previous status. Here's what happened. Now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Do you see the first words there are so important, but now there's the break in Christ, but then it says Christ Jesus. So Christ is just the word for Messiah. But this is saying Messiah has a name. His name is Jesus. The Messiah has a name. The Messiah came in the flesh. And his name is Jesus. And he had a voice. And he could hear. And he planted his feet in soil in the Middle East. And he cried and he got hungry. And at times he was very misunderstood. And at times he was understood perfectly. He would turn over tables. He would welcome children. This Messiah that Israel was waiting for had a name. And what he did is not just bring in those who were near the Jews. That actually would have been too small for his scope. He brings in the nations, you who are far away have been brought near. That idea of being far away, whether it's Deuteronomy, 1 Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, several places I looked at this week, the far away was always the other nations, like those who are far away, he brought near. And how did he bring them near? What does verse 13 end with? Brought near by what? By the blood of Jesus, by the blood of Christ. So this is what's saying, like, what happened? What happened is a living human being, took nails, was bled, you know, bled out, was executed, was condemned, was punished. And all of that was to atone, forgive, justify, and welcome people in. Which is why, like, it's an odd thing if you think about it. It's an odd thing to sing about blood. But we do a lot of singing about blood. Because this blood is different than anything else. This blood is what brought us near, the bleeding out of Jesus Christ for us. And it's almost like in verse, the the rest of the chapter, especially like verses 14 to 17, it's almost as if, if I can use the analogy, you kind of double click on verse 13 and then 14 to 17 open up. Because you get even, it like unpacks it further of exactly what is contained in those who are far away are brought near by the blood of Christ. Which, which does lead me to ask another question, and that is not what happened, but how did it happen? How did all of this happen? And again, we got a glimpse of that in verse 13, but I think it expands in verses 14 to 17 with the announcement in verse 14 that he is our peace. 
How did this happen? Well, he is our peace. And there begins this discussion that I don't know that it's even matched in the New Testament quite like this idea of peace and reconciliation and all this kind of harmony language of, of Jesus bringing things together takes uh, peace, the whole concept of peace and who Jesus is and what he's done and brings those together. So peace in the Bible, I mean, you think of peace, I think of peace as like the absence of conflict, the absence of war, so the people are at peace. The Bible doesn't just limit it to that. It also is not the absence of something, but it's also the presence of something. It's the presence of wholeness and this like sense, everything is as it should be. That's peace. So it is the absence of conflict, but it's something much more. It's the presence of everything being as it should be. And this is what it says. Jesus, all eyes on him, he is our peace which you read other places in the New Testament, you do get the idea he's the mediator of peace. In other words, he's the broker of peace. You also recognize in 2 Thessalonians, he's called the giver of peace, but this is something even more dramatic than that. No, he is our peace. This is who he is. And then he goes to work, right? In in verse 14, he is our peace. He makes both groups, and it just emphasizes, I mean, again and again and again, this idea of both groups, Jews and Gentiles, There was a previous era when they were like very much divided, but now he takes down the middle wall, the the dividing wall of hostility. And he makes both groups one, two entities into one group. When I read like taking down the middle wall, if you're my age older, you probably remembered the images coming out when the Berlin Wall fell and you remember seeing that. And my sister has like a piece of the the Berlin Wall that she got when she took a trip to Berlin. There's this dividing line between East Berlin and West Berlin, dividing line between East Germany and West Germany and just the symbolic nature of that thing coming down and that, yeah, put an exponent of about a hundred million and it's saying what's happened here and that a dividing wall is completely gone. It says in verse 14, 15, in his flesh he made of no effect, so he rendered ineffective, inoperative, the law that was consisting of commands and expressed in regulations. What's that about? Well, my best understanding of this is the regulations and the commands in the law, especially that are referred to here, were those that were really kind of separation regulations. In other words, like dividing line kind of regulations. So what were those? Well, there were, there were plenty. If you read uh, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, even Deuteronomy, you read into the Bible, there's, there's some different kind of stuff in there. So, so there are like this animal, you've got to keep this with, with them, and this animal, you, you keep them distinct. And then it even gets sometimes into plants and farming, like, no, this field is for this crop, and, and like this is in the Bible, and sometimes it's about space, like there's a dividing line, and these people can't go in there, and those people can't. It's, it's all these different things of like division and separation, even fabric at times, like don't combine these two fabrics. What, what is going on with that? I think part of it is signaling there is something very separated about God's people. He wants them to be very distinct. These are his people, and there's a dividing line. And certainly God still wants us to be holy, but he takes all those external forms away. He renders those inoperative. Other places in scripture says because he fulfills them all. They're not going to have the the bearing that they had. So he removes the separation But then notice the intentionality here in verse 15, so that he removes it. He takes down the dividing wall that would keep Jews from Gentiles and he brings people together so that he might create in himself a new race, a new humanity, a new man from the two resulting in peace. He is about creating something new that has not existed before. There was Jew and Gentile, now there's this coming together of something that previously had not existed. It's like, We're in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 categories of God creating something. He's creating something new. And he's bringing all together in Jesus Christ. Verse 16, it says, he did this so that he might reconcile both to God. What's interesting is there's so much in Ephesians, as you're reading along, Okay, so there's so much that's horizontal, right? My relationship with you, my relationships with people of other, let's say, nationalities, ethnicities, other, you know, all that is being, that middle wall is being divided. But there's also a dimension of which, but what if we aren't reconciled, like vertically? What if it's not, what if we're not reconciled to God? And 
God in his mighty act on the cross through Jesus Christ is like removing the barriers horizontally. But the barrier that counts the most is that vertically and now he's reconciled us to himself. Do you understand exactly what's being said here? And in verse 16, he's bringing these two body, these two entities together. It says in one body, which is I think the church, which is his body, Jews and Gentiles. They're not gonna... They're not going to ride separately. So I think of, you get near a big city and there's, so there are these like lanes that anybody can drive in and then there's the HOV lanes or ones, sometimes they have to have a toll where if, if you pay the toll or if you have enough people in your car, you get the ride in that lane. And the picture here is not as if like, oh yeah, there's kind of two lanes going to heaven and one's the VIP lane and then there's all the rest of us but it's actually like, no, the lanes have been merged and we're all together under the umbrella of who Jesus is. He did this so that he would reconcile both to God in one body. And all this happened through the cross. That means, that means, hear this clearly, the barriers are gone. I didn't say the differences are gone. Of course we're different. Of course there's, there's, there's every tribe and tongue and nationality in heaven. Of course the, the, the distinctions, the differences remain but the barrier that would divide us. So yes, this does mean that all, all economic barriers, they're erased when it comes to being reconciled to God. All the racial barriers are erased. The middle wall is, is gone. All the cultural barriers, all the social barriers have been erased. And this is done not through humans and our effort, but this is done through what Jesus has done for us. We hear like this idea of bringing things together. This has been on my mind a lot this week because this is such a passage of unity and this is such a passage of God including people that were previously like divided. And I read this in, in the background, certainly in the month of June, there's another very different kind of effort of bringing people together that humans try to create. The symbol is a rainbow flag, which, by the way, has been redesigned a couple times, redesigned most recently to add some more colors and add some more symbols so that no one possibly can be left out, trying to include, trying to bring people together, assembling letters and an ever-growing list of letters to try to make sure no one feels left out, trying to bring people together, parades, campaigns for 30 days to... Take the month of June to communicate togetherness. And on so many levels, it makes me so sad. It makes me sad for friends and family members who have bought into, this is the inclusion. This is the only way we can include everybody. It makes me sad because some godly friends I know who experience same-sex attraction have to deal with this month and everything kind of front and center in their face. It makes me sad for them the pressure they feel to just give in and quit trying to walk holy. It makes me mostly sad because I know there's a truer story. There's a truer story that isn't all about you. It's all about Jesus. It's a truer story that can actually see and expose and acknowledge the worst parts of me and the worst parts of you and not excuse or justify or rationalize any of it. It's a story that doesn't end in heartache and heartbreak. It's a story that doesn't require everyone to celebrate how you see the world. It's a story based on not what you make up, but a story based on sacrificial love for you. Coming from outside of you. And that story, like this is a very different message than what our culture is going to preach, not just in, I mean, it, it preaches it year in, year out. It's a very different message, what you read here. And make no mistake, it's a very different gospel. What this is saying is that you're included, not because you demanded it, but because you are loved by our Heavenly Father. And it's been demonstrated by his son's bloody cross. That's how peace has come. Which is why there's this declaration of peace 
Do you find that in verse 17? Do you hear it? There's a declaration of peace, good news, good news that can actually come to all people, not just because we add a few more colors or a few more letters, but here's good news in that Jesus came and proclaimed the good news of peace, peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. There's just such a background of this in the Old Testament. One reference that comes to mind is Isaiah 57, verse 19. The Lord says, peace, peace to the one who is far or near and I will heal him. Or Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the herald, the one who proclaims peace, who brings news of good things, who proclaims not just you can make up a reality, but proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. What's amazing is Paul says, Jesus came and preached to you, Ephesus. But we know Jesus in human form never went to Ephesus. And this is 30 years after Jesus had already risen and ascended to the Father. I think what Paul's saying, and it's pretty staggering to think about, that whenever a messenger goes to a school, in your home, to work, and announces that Jesus reigns and has brought peace, it is just as if Jesus himself is preaching. This flawed instrument can be the voice of Jesus saying there is peace. Peace is available just leaves us in a a stunning position. And I feel like at this point, you kind of like, we're going to look at the the remaining verses here. It's like an ocean and we're just going to get up basically to our ankles in the ocean of what all this means. But I, 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 I want to answer that question third. And that is, what does all this mean for you? What does all this mean for us? I mean, I can talk all day long about peace, but what is it? What difference does it make for you? What difference does it make if you're feeling like you're an outsider? If you're sensing like, I don't belong? We'll just look at some of this, but verse 18 tells us one thing it means is we enjoy ongoing access. For through him we both have access, welcome, entrance in one spirit to the Father. The word access was regularly used when you approach royalty, and here it is where you're received and accepted with pleasure. You're not left, oh, sir, wait your turn. Ma'am, I'm sorry, your paperwork isn't in line. You don't get to come in. No, no, there's a welcome. You live every moment in the presence of our Father. He welcomes you, you have access, you can pray at any moment, and you're welcomed. This is a huge, huge privilege. You may feel like such an outsider. But now the curtain, remember even when Jesus died, the curtain's torn, so the presence of God is coming toward us. It's not mysterious and kind of shrouded. Like the Father is moving toward us, which is why we would cry, Abba, Father. This is why we would would recognize we've gotten access through the Spirit to God. And this isn't even just a Curtis thing or just the, you know, the, Uh, a super spiritual category of people kind of thing. This is together we're enjoying access. We take it for granted. I mean, I just bow my head and I start speaking to God. But he's told us to ask and he's told us to seek. You're not alienated. You have access. But it goes even deeper. It says in verse 19, so then you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but your fellow citizens with the saints, your members of God's household. What is that telling you? It's telling you not only do you have access, but you experience true, complete belonging. You belong. You belong in this citizenship. You belong in this household. Jesus assembles people. And it's not just, you know, the strong, the pretty, the Instagram worthy that he's assembling around himself. He's assembling people from every tribe every nation. He's assembling the people that are socially awkward. He's assembling the people that actually are embarrassed and anxious and unsettled. He's assembling those that are humbled. He's assembling those who have disabilities. He's assembling those who have a disorder that maps somewhere on a spectrum. He's assembling those with a diagnosis. He's assembling those who have lost their jobs. He's assembling, he's assembling all these people together, and he's saying to all of them, all of us who are in Christ, you belong. You're not an outsider. 
You don't have a label that says, you don't belong here. He is bringing people in. What security this brings when, when we're not just even part of a, we, we are a citizen, but then also we are brought into the household. We're adopted with all the privileges that come. These are words that speak to, like, you belong here. You belong here. And then the analogy shifts a little bit because it starts like you belong in the household. But then there's kind of this play on word on, on house, not just household, but house. Saying, and while we're talking about building and houses, like there's something else here. You are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What gives us belonging? We, we are built with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. So there were apostles and prophets that gave the message of Jesus, some of those first ones giving the message of Jesus. And then it says, Jesus himself is the cornerstone. So it's that one you lay and then everything else builds around him. And everything's going to like lean on that for support. In him, all of it holds together. He brings it all together. And, And we're built on that foundation, which also means in verse 21, in him, the whole building being put together, which that's you and I, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. That's you and I growing into what? A a holy temple? Verse 22, in him you also are being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit, which means means we have eternal significance. What does this mean? It means that instead of being alienated, you matter. And not just because you woke up and determined you matter, but because God says you're going to be a part of this temple that I'm going to build. Not not a bricks and mortar, but with people, with sinners, with redeemed sinners. And I'm going to build a place where I dwell. People of every nation have become the temple, the dwelling place of God. Which just, I mean, I had to think about it today when I kind of waved goodbye to the charter bus with a bunch of students and adults. And I thought, there, there are those in that bus that know Jesus, a, a bunch of them. And they're the temple, they're the dwelling place of God as they go out to share the message in Union, South Carolina today. In a moment, we, we do something that's just very ordinary, very common in some ways, uh, eating and drinking. We, we'll peel back these tabs and this plastic, but we'll do so, we'll do so in like a holy, reverent way because we know, wait a minute, God dwells here. God dwells with his people. This isn't just a gathering of human beings. Like we, as we gather together, we're a dwelling place for God. I think where it's not just like sacred space because it's mapped out as a a nonprofit. But I think your home, where you gather, where you invite another couple from church some believers and you gather together and you bow your head and you pray and the Lord looks down and like he dwells there in the gathering. I think of a group of widows who are talking to each other, speaking of deep grief and even deeper grace. And God dwells in that gathering. And I think of a gathering where people sing Some people on key, most of us doing our best, making a joyful noise. And in some ways, it's it's just people singing together, but in another way, no, no, no. Our Heavenly Father looks down and through the Spirit, He's dwelling, He's present. This means that as the one, the one who's in Christ, this is, you have eternal significance. So I do, this is somewhat of an invitation. If you say, Curtis, for a long time, I felt like an outsider when it comes to God. Well, Jesus Christ died so you would be brought in. Would you trust him today? Would you trust him today? Would you call out to him to save you? Lean everything you have on him, who he is, what he's done? And maybe, just maybe, if you felt, even as you walked in the door, I really don't know that I even fit at Brainerd Baptist. I don't know that I fit with this group of believers Are you beginning to catch a vision of what it means to be brought in? Do you appreciate today the access you have? The belonging you can experience? The significance of being part of the temple that God is building? I actually want you to take advantage of that access for a moment. We're going to lean into our time of communion, but before we do that, I hate to just rush into that. I'd like for us to take some time and prepare our hearts 
and just get make sure our minds are clear. We focused our attention, our hearts on exactly what's done. Maybe that we say thank you once again for the millionth time. Gratefully that we aren't the outsiders, they aren't the alien, alienated, but we've been brought in. Why don't you take advantage of the access you have, the welcome that the Father extends. I'll lead us in prayer and then we'll take these together. Father, without Christ, we, we aren't the insiders. We're the ones that do, do things that only harm ourselves and harm others. We're alienated, we're strangers. We do things that are legitimately cringeworthy. We do things that cause pain. We weren't looking for you. And without you giving the, mess, the, the mission to your son of saving people from every nation, we would be outsiders looking in. So I thank you for the reminder this morning of the welcome we've received. So for those that feel weak and helpless, for those who feel complete, completely like a misfit, those who don't ever feel like they're the inside group, for those that feel estranged, those who believe they don't matter, they won't matter, awaken our hearts to the grace that comes because of what Jesus did in bleeding and taking nails for us on a cross. And I pray we would know that. And Lord, we even get to enjoy it. Enjoy the cross because we know the punishment that you endured brings peace. So we do eat. And we drink in peace today because of what our Savior has done. And we ask all this in his name.